It's Paula Focus Pulling, and this is a product called the Luxly Cello. It emerged around the time of NAB 2018, and this year, the big talk of the show, or in any case, the excuse for manufacturers to launch new products, make money, and so on, generate buzz in the industry, was uh, RGB lights. And basically what that means is they're LED panels of lights that are capable not only of white or variations on white according to color temperature, but also capable of reproducing a, a wide spectrum of many colors with intuitive controls for more diverse applications, not only in videography, but also in uh, live theatrical and musical performances. This product actually delivered, though, compared to a lot of the hype at NAB, and it comes at a rather surprisingly affordable price point and a great form factor, and it builds on Luxley's prior light, which was a smaller size. Brings largely the same feature set, but um, with now an Android and uh, iOS app. And so this video is going to really do a deep dive into particularly the app and how it controls the product. And then what emerges from that is essentially a review of the product itself. But instead of sort of, I don't know, participating in the sort of increasingly huge crowded space of vloggers who seemed to me to really just go down talking points for the manufacturers, this is going to be really highly technical. So I hope you enjoy this, but hang with me because we're going to get into every little nook and cranny of this device. So in the process of introducing the product, we flipped through some of these still frames that I took with my Sony a7 III uh, with a 90 millimeter FE macro lens. But I think it's a good idea to spend a little bit more time on each one and go back through and then talk about the features of the product as you're looking at a variety of views. So when you see it from the front from a distance, you can see it's a panel, uh, a matrix of LEDs. But when we zoom in, you can see how the actual surface of the glass is molded in such a way as to basically provide magnifying lenses for each of the sets of elements, of LED elements. And then when you fire it up, you can see that it's really directing light forward rather than towards the angled view. So basically, when you're looking at it dead on, it amplifies the light considerably. Um, and so really, this is not a diffuse light source. Um, you can put a diffusion filter in front of it, and in fact, Luxly promises to release a version of the sort of diffusion softbox that they custom molded for the older, smaller sibling of the cello and the orchestra link. But it seems to me, though, on the other hand, that the primary application for this product is really more in the nature of directed color sources, color filtration, and so on. So it's appropriate that they put these highly magnifying directed um, lenses in front of the LED elements, particularly when there's so many different uh, RGB AW elements at play. When you look at the back panel, you can see a slot for what is a standard Sony NPF series uh, battery, and those are incredibly inexpensive. You never need to go with the OEM Sony batteries. So for a few bucks, you get about two hours of power, and sure enough, they give you one uh, with the unit, a generic version of the Sony NPF 750. So about two hours is what I saw too, uh, but you could add a 970 for not a lot more, and that would probably get you north of three hours. Um, it's a big, heavy thing extruding from the back of it, but it's really affordable, easy power to use. There is an option though. At the bottom, you can see a port on the left there for 7 to 15 volts of DC power. Unfortunately, they don't provide you much information about the actual two spec power source that you should use for that, besides that it's DC. So we don't know what the appropriate amperage would be and so on. Um, we shouldn't be deceived either by the US port, USB port just to the right of that. That is a micro USB port only for firmware upgrades if they happen. Um, that is not for connecting a USB power brick or power supply or AC adapter. And that must be because of the fact that USB only provides 5 volts DC. And they designed this product to begin at 7 volts minimum and go all the way up to 15 volts as a possible range. But the back panel of the product, you can see what the controls consist of. And there are basically two dials and then a button underneath it um, for mode selection. So what do each of these do? Well, the top dial is um, something that flips between uh, parameters within each of the modes that you might be in. So 
Um, for example, if you're in the gel mode, then by turning it, you can change between gels. Um, if you're in the white balance mode, then you're changing color temperatures and so on. The bottom knob, as you turn it, simply increases the brightness from 0% to 100%. The cool thing about the interface to make it possible to use it without app control, even though app control provides you a lot more options, is that if you press in the momentary switch of each knob, um, they each do different things. The top one actually um, then pushes you between different sort of default settings um, that are the sort of most commonly used presets within each mode. And then if you push in the bottom switch, uh, I'm sorry, the bottom knob, it's a momentary switch that basically turns on and off the light itself, which is useful not only for saving batteries while you're configuring the product, but also if you don't want the light to fire up before it's ready with whatever settings you wanted to load up. That's how you can control um, the on-off of the light. The red switch at the bottom is not the easiest thing to find with your hand or to really locate. It's small, but it works. Um, I would have liked it to have been a little better. On the other hand, by being indented, you don't get accidental presses. But basically, that's the mode selector. That goes between white balance mode, which then in turn you can change between color temperatures. But in other words, no color information besides um, color temperature within white balance. And then it goes to the full spectrum of color that you can adjust using the knobs. And then it also goes into the gel modes and then finally the special effects modes. The red button just to the right of that is simply the power switch on off. So now that we've seen our way around the manual controls on the body of the Luxly cello itself, the way that you might end up actually controlling it more often is via Bluetooth using a smartphone or tablet app. And for a long time, um, with the Luxly product line, it had only been available on iOS for um, Apple products. But now, past few weeks, uh, they made an Android app. So here I've found it on the uh, App Store. You just type in Luxly. And then I've already downloaded it here, but you can see if we drill into it, it gives you a little more description about what it's able to control, intensity, color, temperature, hue, saturation. And there's even some modes that are some special effects. So one theme that will emerge from all of this is the fact that not only um, is this light useful for video production, but it can even be useful for live stage uh, musical performances, for example. And one of the cool things that we'll be able to see but not quite demonstrate here because I only have at the moment one Luxly light is that you can control multiple devices, which is a pretty killer feature. But anyways, I'm going to open up the app now that it's already downloaded. And then the way this is going to work is you can see a 1.1x projection screen. That means its reflection quality boosts it just a little bit. But there's a little bit of outdoor color temperature coming in because this is during the daytime. But I wanted to kind of let you see everything that's going on. And then, you know, I'll zoom in occasionally to that back panel, that beautiful um, display on the back of the Luxly Cello. But we can also focus um, on the Android app at the bottom right. You certainly can't see my thumbs swiping over and telling you or showing you which buttons I'm pushing. But you'll at least be able to see what the app is doing vis-a-vis -vis, um, the controls of the product. Now that we've loaded the Luxly Conductor app, we're sent to the main mode that you're probably going to spend most of your time in. And it's indicated by the center, what looks like a color wheel icon at the bottom and you can see the little blue highlight above that. And then just to the right and above that is the word white and then a red X. Actually, the red X is saying if you tap it, you're going to leave the white balance mode, but that's where we are. And then if you go to the, the two rows of three icons towards the top, right under enter Kelvin value, we have something that probably looks familiar to you if you know your way around a camera with white balance settings. Um, it should be familiar that basically the world of color temperatures and white balance settings range from what we commonly call indoor and outdoor. It's not that simple, but it begins with the idea that 3200 Kelvin, which is the amount that you actually see on the back of the Luxley's, Luxley Cello's um, display panel, 3200 Kelvin is so-called incandescent indoor color temperature. So a typical historic light bulb is basically a fire, the orangey burning color between two electrical uh, conductors, and then the filament is what's burning. 
So fire, right? Dating back to primitive man sitting around campfires, we think of, of, of artificial light at night as being somewhat of that orangey uh, color temperature. And then the other end of that spectrum of common color temperatures is the sun, of course. And then outdoor color temperature is 5,600 Kelvin. So I'm tapping that picture of the sun at the top right of the f- top row. And you can see the back panel of the Luxley cello changes to 5,600 Kelvin. So the irony there is that we make the color temperature go higher, that is to say hotter, and yet in common lingo on a set, we say that we're cooling it off. And then if we say we're warming it up, we're actually lowering the color temperature to make it more orange. So let's finally see some action. On the bottom left of the screen, you can see a picture of an illuminating circle. That is the brightness control. I'm not going to go up to 100 so that we don't blow out highlights and then lose color information on this camera setup. But I'm going to go up to about 50. And now that I'm there, um, what uh, we're seeing right now is the outdoor uh, color temperature lighting, whereas my Sony a7 III like any good cinematographer, I've locked it into a certain setting and right now I'm indoors. And so what one would typically do on an indoor shoot nighttime is set the color temperature to 3200 Kelvin incandescent indoor. So what's happening here is that it looks bluish because of the fact that I have it set to outdoor color temperature. So to offset that, I'm going to tap that picture of the incandescent bulb at the top left right now. And then to my eyes right now, as I'm watching this on my 1.1x reflective projection screen, it looks pretty orange. But in reality to you, it looks pure white, like correct white. So this is, of course, as you know, the process of doing white balance, right? It's about illuminating things in a way that matches the color temperature settings of the camera and the surrounding environment so that we get true white. Um, going down the rows of icons down in the, the top middle one is fluorescent. So fluorescent, when I tapped that, you can see on the back panel, it went to 4,300 Kelvin. It's somewhere basically between indoor fiery color temperature and outdoor, if you will, bluish, um, color temperature from the sun. A little side note, it's kind of interesting if you recall maybe from a physics class or astronomy class when you were in high school or college, that when we say blue giants as stars, and then you compare that to red giants, I remember in class, kind of we all assumed that a red giant was bigger and stronger than the blue giant. But in reality, a blue giant is healthy and strong, and then it's sort of a red giant is on its way out. So to further kind of prove the point that even though we say, sort of hotter color temperature when the sun is fiery orange we actually are talking about the sun's true color temperature which is a higher kelvin but a colder looking color and now here i go tapping that and we get up to 5600 kelvin okay and then on the bottom row you see a picture an icon of clouds so i'm going to tap that Um, 6400 kelvin going even higher why because um, when the sun is subjected to clouds the angle of light also affects color temperature. And so clouds are um, further increasing, if you will, the color temperature of the light. And we need to offset that. If we were, for example, using this light to illuminate a subject that was under the same color temperature of a cloudy angled condition. Um, Bottom middle, we've got a house with pictures of rain. So sure enough, precipitation does things to the angles of light and thus color temperature. And then lastly, on the bottom right, we see a snowflake. And to your eyes in particular, since my a7 III is set to 3200 Kelvin as a reference point, now it's really looking bluish. And the reason it's really looking bluish is because we're all the way up to 10,000 Kelvin, which is even beyond the range of normal sunlight, looking very bluish in reference to 3200 Kelvin. But let's get back to that safe, sweet spot where it's a match. I've just tapped the top left incandescent setting, so we're back to 3200 Kelvin. Okay, so those are the sorts of um, defaults, but there's one more cool thing. I find myself often, probably you do too, undissatisfied by the precise incandescent, for example, indoor color temperature, because usually we have sort of a toxic mix of lots of different artificial light sources when we're, when we're shooting indoors. 
So 3,200 Kelvin might not cut it, but I find very often, if not weirdly the majority of the time, 3,400 Kelvin might be the place where I want to be. So then the cool thing about this light is that you can actually drill down to a precise setting like that. So let's say I'm going to tap in that K enter Kelvin value box with my thumb, and then I'm going to enter in 3400. 3400 Kelvin is just a little, so to speak, uh, you know, higher color temperature. We would say it cooled it off a little bit. Um, and that would be, again, in a situation where maybe you have a little indoor outdoor light fighting with your incandescent indoor lighting sources. Okay, so we've seen how we have presets for a variety of white balance settings in Kelvin. We can also manually type in any value. And then what we can also do is a mode that's getting us to the infinite color control, or really nearly infinite color control between RG and B. All the craze at uh, NAB this year, right? If there was one theme this year, it was RGBW lighting. Um, the reason why I find this to be the most exciting project product in that whole kind of stir of product launches is not only that this is more affordable than some of those ProLine products, but also, again, this smartphone remote app functionality is unparalleled. It's kind of incredible. Um, using the use filter toggle that currently says no, we're able to also begin to move our way into the color world. And when we tap it, we're sent first to what to your eyes is going to look sort of baby blue to my eyes. And that's again, because of the 3200 Kelvin setting on the a seven three, um, to my eyes, it's a pretty deep blue. And then look what it says, uh, on the screen of the smartphone. It says chroma key blue. So what this mode is, it says use filter. Yes. We could call this the gel mode. So what a gel is, you probably know is, uh, especially in theatrical lighting, when a lighting designer puts a mostly transparent, um, usually celluloid or plastic sheet in front of a light that adds a tint to it, a color tint to it. And in this case, it's almost as if um, virtually, without having to physically do so, I put a reference chroma key colored gel in front of the light. Now, this is pretty common. And I'm going to press plus right now on the right from that 150 to move to the next um, setting, which is chroma key green, which is the far more familiar chroma key color. And again, to your eyes, with the white balance being set as it is on my camera, it looks pretty bright green. But to my eyes, it's that classic chroma key green that you've probably seen if you've ever been on a set where you're trying to do green screening um, and keying out backgrounds, for example. Um, so this is, this is something that you would use, for example, if you want to illuminate something and, but keep it consistent with the chroma color so that you're able to further key it out. Is that making any sense? Sometimes you want to light things up so that they don't fight against the chroma key, but work with it. Um, so for example, you might use this as a kicker so that, um, you're illuminating things, um, you're, you're sort of able to tailor the light so that it disappears. And then you would use another key light, let's say on your talent that isn't set to chroma key green so that you further isolate things. This is what all lighting designers do. They use separate lights with different color temperatures and different intensities and different angles to make things appear and disappear relative to each other. I'm just going to keep tapping plus and you can see as we go through, we get plus green next, we get half plus green quarter plus green. So you can see all these infinite gradations, but then next I'm just going to go ahead and move things along more quickly. And I'm going to drag the slider that you see in the center of the screen over. It's a little laggy, but as I move along this one, it says pale gold. I'm going to get more into the, wow, that's pretty uh, provocative, loving Amber. And then again, to your eyes, a little bit more on the orangey side, but truly it's kind of a more reddish Amber tone. Let me jump over here to something called pale lavender to your eyes, a little more bluish, but because of the 3200 Kelvin setting on the a seven three, um, to my eyes, on the other hand, true pale lavender. Let me get to more of these blues over here. Regal blue is, uh, looking sort of more sky blue or baby blue to you more in the purple direction to me as I look at it. And then finally, let me get all the way over to these sorts of more greenish colors over here. Dark yellow green, it says. Kind of what you're seeing too. What's the value of this? Well, uh, a few reasons. One is 
These actually have numbers, don't they? As I'm tapping down, you can see the numbers keep changing. Um, if you want to recreate a set setting, um, if you know that you're going to do a shoot over several days, or for that matter, if you're taking a break or whatever, if you want to reset the lights to a precise color temperature, these are some gel settings where you'll always be able to go back and reproduce exactly what color you had on your talent. Um, it also is sort of industry standard colors. Another, again, the great example being chroma key green, where you can really rely on that matching true chroma key green. I like to think in the desktop publishing or the printing world of Pantone colors. It's uh, a sort of a master reference book that's a universal standard. Here, it's not necessarily quite such a universal numerical standard, but at least as a tool for you, you have all of these. Now, later we'll show you pretty briefly, though, um, the way that you actually can store presets also. Um, but these are never going to go away. They're always burned in there. You don't even have to save them. And you can always go back to any particular, so to speak, gel and reproduce that exact gel. Okay. So um, I'm going to turn off this use filter function. Tap this to say no. Now we're back to the white balance. And then again, I'm going to go back to 3200 Kelvin by hitting the incandescent icon. And now you can see 3200 Kelvin on the back panel of the uh, screen. I'm going to go back real quick to the filters just to note that, you know, when you are moving things around, uh, you can see how it gives you the gel number on the back panel of the Luxley cello, and it gives you a color temperature readout. And of course, we're always seeing what the uh, light intensity is. I've kept this around 50%. Okay, so turning off the filter again. So this mode was basically, even though it's labeled white, the idea here is these are not uh, trying to find colors intuitively, but rather finding reference colors that will be of assistance when we're trying to light up something with proper white balance um, or some specific reproducible uh, lighting color temperature, lighting setting. But let me tap the white uh, icon with the red X to go away from that and to this other place that I would really describe as sort of a intuitive, uh, you know, find what you like sort of interface because as you'll see, look at the circle and as I move it around, Bluetooth is a little laggy, but you can see that it keeps varying the color temperature as I move it over the different spaces. Now the farther I go down, the less saturated it is. So it's almost like a saturation slider. And indeed, you know, in the manual controls, since they don't have this kind of more touch sensitive, what you see is what you get interface, there was a way of changing the saturation value. It was really a combination of the saturation knobs uh, parameters with the tint parameter on the manual knob that was able to achieve this. But this is a lot more intuitive than using the dials on the back of the device because, again, the higher I go, the more saturation, the more the volume control on color intensity is turned up. The more I go down, the less intense it is and the closer I get to white. And of course, when I'm all the way at the bottom, it's just some variation on white in, in general. So again, infinite control of finding the color that I want. How is this useful? It's hard to say. I mean, if you have a really great eye for, if your goal is to match color temperatures, this is one way to do it. But it's also just a creative tool. But what if you really want to drill down into matching something from an existing resource. Well, there's something super interesting and really innovative about this app also. And it's going to be, if you go to the bottom where we've been in this, we haven't even left this center icon at the bottom that looks like a color wheel. I'm gonna tap the icon just to the right of that. And that takes us to an interface where it's essentially a color picker. So if you've used some Adobe products like Photoshop, and even inside of Premiere where you have color picker uh, capability for things like color grading, secondary color correction. Uh, I'm gonna tap on this, on my tablet here, I do have stored a picture, it happens to be a poster frame from a film that I made. And there's a target where the, what is in the crosshairs of the target, uh, the Lux Lee uh, conductor app is analyzing the precise color information right at those crosshairs and then conveying that to the cello to do a match. So as I move this around to the more bluish sky, you can see that sure enough, if you look on the back panel of the Luxley cello, you can see that it faithfully reproduced 
a sort of sky blue background, and then indeed the actual color being projected by the lights on the Luxly cello are that sort of same matching tint. So this is kind of extraordinary. If I go back it down again to the particularly reddish, orangish portion of this dead grass on a ranch in central California, you can see it's really capturing that as well. Super valuable. Okay, so it sort of, if you will, stored that. And then if I go back to the center mode, the main mode, the uh, location of the crosshairs right now is being reflected. So in other words, the circle has literally moved to that spot. Now, if I tap the bottom left, well, I should say the second row up, the row up from the bottom, the, you see the sliders that say RGB. Another way of representing this infinite sort of color spectrum, intuitive, what you see is what you get interface, is by going to these sliders. So rather like the filters or the gels in that mode, this is a way of, of nailing down precise numerical values of the relative balance of red, green, and blue. There are a lot of reasons why this could be useful. One of them could be, you know, the sort of Photoshop style workflows, um, or again, for recording precise numbers and then coming back to them at a later time. So I'm going to tap the red X under RGB to go out of that mode, which takes us back to this sort of default color picker. Another interesting fact to note is that something I can't easily reproduce here is the way that um, in when I was in this mode, I could uh, turn, let me go back actually, if I swipe to the right actually, what this is is actually something I can't capture right now in this dark environment. It's a camera. And then what the camera is doing is it's capturing um, with a live view, uh, again, under crosshairs, whatever color the camera on the tablet is capturing at the moment, it then faithfully selects the color to match. So if I swipe back out of it, this is what it captured even though you couldn't see. So that's kind of an extraordinary, super cool thing where on the set, you could literally use your smartphone or your, or your tablet, point the camera at something, say, I want to match that color, and then boom, your Luxly cello is matching that color and projecting it. So that was that mode. Um, yeah, I should have mentioned, it's, it's also accessible besides a swipe by the little camera icon. I'm going to do that again, just to the left of the center, at the bottom, the left of the center color wheel. But it sometimes has a tendency to crash. And I think it's because of my old tablet. Interesting warning is that you can see it says looking for devices at the top. Um, I think that this has to do with a combination of factors, including maybe the fact that their app is still new for Android, still under development. But I will predict for you, if you have, let's say maybe it's a symptom also of an earlier version of Android, this is 6.0 instead of 8.0 Oreo. Um, when you sort of leave the app or let it go into sleep mode, um, you can see that it's now infinitely at top left saying looking for devices. And then the problem is, is that you're not going to rediscover uh, and relink to Bluetooth this way. What you actually have to do, and this is a big bummer, and this is a little, little tip, troubleshooting tip. You actually have to clear the cache, which is what I'm doing right now. So that basically cleared all the residue from gunked up data while the app was loaded. And then you also need to say force stop. And that forces it from running in the background loading the app again, then turning the light back on, I was able to reestablish a Bluetooth connection. Again, this is not something I've seen on newer Android devices, but if you run into it, that's one of the cures. There's one more thing we want to look at, which is really cool, but probably less frequently a part of your usage of this device, but still sort of like a bonus round of coolness. Um, you see at the bottom left, the row of different things we've tried, there is the FX icon. So let's go there. And it's a fairly small list, but still impressive list of five different uh, features. The first is probably the least useful um, in the sense that it's just kind of all over the place and, and um, I don't know how to say flamboyant, but when you tap it, you're given a cycle through uh, the range that you select of the so-called rainbow of colors. And then you can see a speed um, slider at the bottom. So I'm going to slow it down. Whoops, I'm gonna slow it down this way to something that moves a lot slower. So you can see it's very gradual now, right? But if I want to go on steroids 
or speed or whatever, you can see it can move a lot faster. And if I go up to 100%, it just gets insane, doesn't it? So yeah, one can imagine some scenarios where this makes sense. I suppose um, music would be an example of this. Um, this begins sort of the insight that I think um, makes this a very dual purpose product. It could even reach completely different market segments because even though videographers, particularly with the white balance features, can really make use of this device and it differentiates from other devices because of the intuitive controls for white balance purposes, it also definitely, uh, I'm going to calm down here. It also can be used in live concert settings and for shows and entertainment, basically live venue events. And so maybe it won't be rainbow per se, but I'm going to go back to the options. The other option is called lightning. So with that, sure enough, the color temperature doesn't, they don't let you vary the color temperature. They're just giving you the color, actual color temperature of lightning. I mean, they might even be so clever as to chosen the exact Kelvin value of lightning as it exists in the natural world. But the only thing you can do here is you can vary the, um, the intensity, if you will, which has a lot to do with speed, I think. So I'm going to see what happens when I drag this up higher. And you can see the intensity, if you will, is higher. If I go all, all the way up to 100, or just Halloween, right? Or light distant lightning. It seems like it's quicker flickers. Anyways, this is a classic example of you do things to taste. Um, at the bottom, you can see the pause icon. So one example of how that's useful is if you're in a theatrical setting or for that matter, do on a shoot and you need to have this in queue, but not quite activated. Sure enough, I'm tapping right now play and I can have it start and then just stop. Great. Let me go back one. The next mode is called sign and a sine wave you might know from the sound world is basically as you see it on the screen right there it's just a very elegant smooth rounded up down up down uh, we can change the color temperature to something else so i tapped the change color icon and then i was able to go to one of these different colors i press done i'm able to go back and then when it comes to speed it's as simple as it sounds i can really go crazy or I can make it a really slow pulse, such as let's say you're doing a science fiction film and it's a red alert, in which case I would go to red. I'd have it set to this and that looks to me like a red alert. Okay, I'm gonna go back one level. The next effect, the explosion effect, seemed to me the least useful maybe. But it might be that I just simply haven't figured it out, but you can see the play button at the bottom. It really waits for you to press it. Okay, so it sort of turns off and then back on again. You can control the duration of that fall off and you can tr control the fall off percentage itself. So as I change these values, I get only the slightest changes to what it does. And that, my friends, is all of the might and fury of an explosion. Okay. There's one more though, and it is actually much more satisfying than that. And of course, strobe. So strobe is super cool. Right now it's set to 50%. So it sort of begs the uh, definition of strobe. But when we go up to a speed that's much higher, sure enough, not for the, the what do they call it? The, the, the di dyslexic? No, not dyslexic. Epileptic. Warning. Um, so there's the 82% speed. If I go crazy with 100%, that really begins to look like a strobe. And then the cycle, uh, I'm not sure what that does. I think it has to do with the ramping of the in and the out. But the default is certainly a safe place. And then the color by default is a certain thing, but you can certainly go crazy with that too. And when I say done here, I've got a red strobe as well. Okay, enough goofing around. When I hit the center at button, which is that uh, color wheel at the bottom, there I am again, and I'm going to go to white and then select indoor so that we're back to our default white balance screen. Okay, so that has been a terribly long uh, trip through the app, 
but I wanted to make it as thorough as possible because I'm so excited about this product. It is pretty extraordinary. A few last things to just uh, make sure you understand how uh, it really the where this can really shine is when you have multiple uh, of these items, not just the cello, but the smaller companion unit that has less uh, lights, um, smaller. You can have numerous of these all connected together. So at the very top, you see that circle with a one inside. There are ways to, and if it were activated, if I had more than one connected via Bluetooth at one time, I would be able to actually independently control them or actually gang them together, if you will, and control them in tandem with each other. That's a pretty cool feature. So you could be having an effects um, happening on one of them. You could be having different color temperatures on two different ones. You could have different intensities, different brightnesses. One's a key light, one's a fill light. Um, all those things. So that's one interesting feature. Uh, then on the top right, you see that on um, the square with the on in the middle. I'm going to tap that real quick, and then you can see it turns red. Simply put, it turns off the light, uh, but leaves the unit on so that you can continue making adjustments. There's a few reasons why that's cool. One is if you just simply don't want it on for the sake of the set, um, because it's not time to illuminate things yet, but you want to get things ready. This is a way of moving things around, changing values, changing filters without seeing it yet. And then sure enough, when you turn it back on, you'll be at the setting that you want. Another reason that could be valuable is simply to save battery life. That's all I have to say about the Luxly Cello, but happy to continue exploring the product. I'll be using it in my work, showing it in my work, and also answering any comments and questions you might have uh, on this video and at the blog at www.focuspulling.com. Mm -hmm.